God, who keeps covenant with his people, who preserves his people, who has brought the Jewish people down to this day, it's because of our God. We're going to tell the story that you will read in your Bibles. We call the part that we're going to read it from, we call it the original covenant. You probably call it the Old Testament. Nothing wrong with that, but sometimes people hear that word old, and they think it's old, it's antiquated, you know, we're done with it. Aha, uh -huh, never. <laughs> it's all part of God's word. So using the term original takes away that old connotation, and yet if we're talking about the very same books. We'll explain more as we go on. But I know some of you have been adopted into my family recently, and that means I do need to explain a little bit as we go, and if I forget to explain something, you're free to red flag me and say, what? <laughs> and I'll try to help you understand. But in the beginning, when this all was started, I have to take you back in the original covenant to the book called Shmote. You call it Exodus. Exodus chapter 12 in particular will give us the detail. What it's going to tell you about is the history of Passover. Passover is God's preservation of our Jewish people, God's chosen people, when they were down to about 70 to 75 people. I'm going to hazard a guess that we have around that tonight. So if you took all the Jewish people at that time, you could put them in one room. That's how small they were in number. They went down to Egypt to escape seven years of pestilence and uh, famine that was brought on by drought. But previous to this time, Joseph, you call him Joseph, was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. God had allowed him though because God was working behind the scenes and he worked on those in Egypt for Joseph not only to be free from slavery, but to be raised up to second in position. So at the time of our story, he was in a place of power, a place of position to be a physical savior for our people at that time, not the savior. I make a big you know, declaration of that. But our Jewish people went down to Egypt to survive, and they liked it. They liked it a little too well. <laughs> so they settled in for about 400 years. The problem is, by that time, it was a different pharaoh, it was a different regime, and those that were there noticed that the Jewish people had done something in particular. Where they went down small in number, they now were very large in number. We're talking easily, by the time they leave Egypt, two and a half to three million people. So Egypt began to be concerned. If all of these people were to go against Egypt, and let's say an enemy came against Egypt and the Jews sided with the enemy, then Egypt could lose its own land and they could lose their lives. They didn't want to take that chance, so they decided they'd better subdue the Jewish race. So they put them into slavery, they put harsh taskmasters over them, they beat them, they tortured them, they caused our people, as Shmo, as Exodus chapter 2 says, to groan and to moan. They were suffering. Finally, they started groaning and moaning and crying out to their God. And God heard their cries, and he sent for them a deliverer. In Hebrew, we call that deliverer Moshe. In English, you call him Moses. Now, I forgot to tell you, when you're part of my family and you're part of Passover, you're part of the story. So if you thought you had a free ride tonight, <laughs> you get to participate. And we're going to have a number of different times where you do participate. This is one of them. We've got a special song. We like to make Passover fun. I love seeing the kids throughout because we want to keep the kids happy. We want them to be able to get their wiggles out. So we add in and we have fun. And then I see a lot of kids at heart. So feel free to clap hands, feel free, whatever you want to do to express, it's all kosher tonight. So we're going to sing Go Down Moses. The words will be on the screens and please sing it with us because if you hear me sing, I'm going to throw you off tune. I make a joyful noise. <laughs> so help me. Let's sing Go Down Moses. It's coming right up. It will come up. I have faith. <laughs>
excellent job. I saw a lot really enjoying it, so we're off to a great start. I failed to introduce myself. My name is Rochelle, but tonight you can say Ima because I'm the mom tonight, <laughs> at least at this point. Uh, at this time, God began to send the plagues on the Egyptian land to get Pharaoh to soften his heart so that he would let the Jewish people go. The famous 10th plague, the, the death of the firstborn of human life and of animal life, is one known by everyone, I would, I would think, that God wanted to spare the Israelites from that plague falling on them. So to escape it, he gave them specific instructions regarding the Passover, well at this point, regarding the lamb and the blood of the lamb. I'll explain that in just a bit as we get to that point. But the blood was put on the doorposts of the home, and when the death angel was sent, he would see that blood, and he would pass over that home. That's why it's called Passover. That's how it gets its name. Later, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which follows right after Passover ends. Passover technically is one day long. We start at sundown. It started Wednesday night sundown. So Thursday night, tonight, as the sun sets, it will start the second day of Passover. Why we say that is because in our scriptures, in Viagra, in the book of Leviticus, we're told about the unleavened bread that is seven days long. Since Passover also incorporates unleavened bread, and I'll explain what that is later also, we just commonly call the whole eight days Passover. It's like the umbrella title given to it now. Um, the days are always different because the Jewish people follow the lunar calendar rather than the Gregorian uh, sun calendar. So that's why this year starts, as I said, yesterday at sundown, but it will not always be that same date on your calendar. Now, again, the directions and instructions all for the very first one come from Shmoke, from Exodus chapter 12. I'll read a few of those verses for you. God was speaking and he said to Moshe, Speak to all the assembly of Israel and say, On the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb or a kid for his family, one per household. Your animal must be without defect, a male in his first year. You're to keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it at dusk. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the two sides and the top of the door frame at the entrance of the house in which they eat it. Now, if you dropped it down to verse 22 in this same chapter, it tells you that they were to take hyssop, and with the hyssop, they were to apply the blood. Once it was applied, they were to stay inside. Now, I think Roger's going to help us, and you'll see in a moment, hyssop comes in many shapes and forms, but it's always a lowly uh, shrub. It's not fancy. It's not meant to be. It's a, a sign of humbleness or lowliness. In scripture, every time we see hyssop and clean water used together, we see it was for cleansing, for purification. The hyssop would be like taking several of the branches and tying it together and making it like the paintbrush. Whether it was sprinkling on a leper who'd come to the priest to be declared clean, or the, in our case, on the doorpost, which when he has it there, okay, here's our hyssop, so you get an idea. But if you called up hyssop or if you've grown hyssop and it's looked different, that's fine. It doesn't mean, it, it is just, it comes many ways. Melch David, King David. In Tehillim, in Psalm 51, verse 7, said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be white as snow. So we see again, purification coming from the use of hyssop. It's aromatic. It also has medicinal properties, and that's why when Yeshua Jesus was on the cross, they offered it to him mixed with the vinegar to help aid in the suffering that he was taking place to not feel it as much. But when it was put on the doorpost of the home, and I'll show you how in a moment, on the doorpost, it was to speak of protection, it was to speak of deliverance, especially of belief. They were believing in God's promise, they were believing what God had told them, and so they would follow these instructions, strike it on their doorpost, and then go inside the house and stay in the house for the rest of the evening. Now, as they put it on the doorpost of the home, they were to put it on the top of the doorpost, and if they had a basin, 
that was full of the blood from the, the lamb that had been slaughtered, and they dip the hyssop brush in, and they're brushing, it's definitely going to drip. Then they had to put it on the sides, and you can begin to see what's beginning to form as I'm making the motion. But we also see something else very interesting in this shape. I've got, he's got it up there to see over the doorpost. This is the letter Het in our Hebrew Olive Bait. See the similarity? Now a lot of people look at this and they say it almost looks like the lamp. You've got the head and you've got the legs. So with a good imagination, and we're all kids tonight, right? <laughs> you can see that. But as you also see it in the shape on the doorpost, let me tell you that Het, uh, the word Het, starts with this letter, and, well, actually, the whole letter is that word, and it means or stands for sin. So when we're seeing the letter, we're already thinking about sin. And when we see that we can add letters to it, we see that we can move from het, which is sin, to chaya, which is life, or chai, living and, and life, we see that life can come out of death. When we see that it's placed on the doorpost to protect the people from death, we see that meaning. And as we go on through the evening, I hope that you will see and understand that when it's applied to the doorpost of your heart, you come into a new life, into living in a different way. Now, this just happens to be the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, alphabet and uh, that reminds us of the eighth day of circumcision. Again, a start, a new name that's given. We see eight in scripture means new beginnings. We see there were eight covenants that God made with his people. The first one was the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant that had to do with circumcision. Again, we're drawn back into that picture. Uh, we celebrate Sukkot, another holiday, and Hanukkah, another one also, eight days long. So eight is very significant, especially when we see a new life, a new beginning. And as we go through the course of the evening, I believe that you will see there's much meaning behind all of our symbols, all the symbolization that we are showing. So as they had put this on the doorpost, and let me point out to you also, if you knew that God had given the command, Put the blood on your doorpost. When the death angel sees, he'll pass over. I can guarantee you no one was up there doing one little dribble. They're going to be painting it. So they're going to see that shape because they're going to want to make sure that their house is safe. Now God gave them some more instructions. So as I go back to Shemot, to Exodus chapter 12, I read in verse 8 that that night they're to eat. You will get to eat. <laughs> and in front of you is like an appetizer, obviously, because you help bring dinner tonight, you know there's more coming. But this is how they were to eat it. They were to eat it that night. They're to eat the meat, the, the lamb. They're to eat it roasted in the fire. And they're to eat it with matzah and moror. You may not know what those two words mean. I will explain them in just a bit. But here's how they're to eat it. With a belt fastened, shoes on their feet, staff in hand, you're to eat it hurriedly. It is Adonai's Pesach, the, the Lord's Passover. For that night, I, God speaking, will pass through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and animals. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am Adonai. I am Lord. The blood will serve you as a sign marking the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I strike the land of Egypt, the death blow will not strike you. Then there's a couple more verses that I just want to bring out because they have meaning as we go on through the evening. Verse 14 says, This will be a day for you to remember and celebrate as a festival to Adonai. From generation to generation, you are to celebrate it by a perpetual regulation. That's you tonight. You're celebrating Passover. You're keeping the regulation. Verse 15 says, For seven days you're to eat matzah. On the first day, remove the leaven from your houses. We'll explain that. For whoever eats hummets or leavened bread from the first to the seventh day is to be cut off from Israel. Cut off from Israel, you would miss out on all the promises of God, all the blessings of God. It, it's as good as a death sentence. So it was something that was to be taken very seriously. And then lastly, I want to draw your attention to verse 26. 
When your children ask you, what do you mean by this ceremony? Say, it's the sacrifice of Adonai's Pesach, of the Lord's Passover, because Adonai passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he killed the Egyptians but spared our houses. I'd like to ask you by a show of hands, how many in here are the firstborn in their family? We've got a good little representation. I'd say at least a third, maybe almost half of the room. This would have affected you. If you did not have that blood on the doorpost, that would have been you at that time. Now, as we go through, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, one quick. As we go through the evening, in my explanation, I'd like to tell you that this comes from the Orthodox tradition. They are the ones who are the most serious about trying to adhere to the scriptures and to please God. My father was born into an Orthodox Jewish home. He, he was taught how to keep it when you keep it every year in your home. By the time you're an adult, you don't have to be taught. You carry on in your home with no exception and no problem. Now, by the time he had children, he had come to believe that Yeshua Jesus was his Messiah, his Savior, and so he taught us our traditions, but also taught us the fulfillment right from the beginning. So I've had the privilege of growing up with the perfect blend, what I call Judeo-Christianity, where Judaism is the bad and Christianity is the flower, and I see the complete picture. And that's what I'll share with you this evening, but the traditions I give you, you can go to another Passover. If it's not following Orthodox traditions, a lot will be similar, but there will be little changes. And then it is a little bit of freedom with the families too. Not every family does go down Moses. There are many songs to choose from. Some like to act it out. Some like to give each member of the family a portion and they're responsible for that. And however they decide to do it is how it's done. So there's freedom. It keeps it from being old. But it's important that the story is told again and again. And the scriptures tell certain things have to be included. So I'll explain that as we go on. The biggest thing is that everything has to be made kosher for Passover. And kosher means pure. So you may have seen kosher food in the market. You may have seen other times where you've seen that word kosher. But, and I didn't think to keep one. My box of matzah today, if you see it at, at, at any time, it says that it's kosher for Passover. That means that it's, they've tried even a little bit harder, a little bit more stringent to try to get a little more pure, if at all possible. So the matzah that, that's used for Passover has been watched from the time the grain was put in the field. They've watched it be, grow up and be harvested. They've watched it be taken to the factory, made into the matzah that, that it is, sealed, and when it's ready to send out the door, as long as nothing has happened all along the way to contaminate it, then it gets that kosher for Passover seal put on it. Uh, it still has to be almost that pure year-round, but again, just a little bit harder. Now, the mother has the greatest job before Passover, and I think this is where spring cleaning came from. Even though that's an art that's done, I think it, it stems from this, because she has to clean the entire house from attic to basement, if they have an attic and if they have a basement. Everything has to be clean. So your walls are clean, your furniture is clean, your carpets are clean, besides everything that's sitting on all of that. It's quite a job. And Mama Ima has to watch also because if her children go out to play and they come in with dirt on their feet and they come into a room she's clean, it no longer is kosher enough for Passover. So I have a feeling that pretty much of the time they kind of get a room done and close the door and say, not till after Pesach. <laughs> but uh, she works very hard. You go into the kitchen and you have to get rid of everything that has leaven in it. Anything that rises, breads and pastries, anything that has leaven in it, uh, leaven being what will make that rise, has to be removed from the house. But it doesn't stop there. All through the year, our Jewish women, our Orthodox Jewish women, have had two sets of dishes. They've never crossed, they've never touched, they kept them completely separate. If they were doing a meal with dairy products, they used the dairy dishes. If it was meat, they used the meat dishes. They washed them in separate sinks, they stored them in separate cupboards, they've been separated the whole time. 
But remember that little, a little bit higher standard? Well, maybe even though we've tried so hard during the year, a little bit of hummus, a little bit of leaven has somehow etched its way into our everyday dishes. So we put those away and we pull out two more sets of dishes. These have only been used at Passover time. So they're used for eight days out of the year. Then they'll be packed back up and they will be put in a cupboard or a closet, something where they're closed off and left alone until Pesach the next year. So how many can figure out what a Jewish bride wants for a wedding gift? <laughs> She's thrilled to get duplicates. She gets four sets of dishes. She's ready to keep a kosher home. Uh, having cleaned everything, having gotten all the leaven out of the home, I should tell you, back in the olden days, what often happened is our Jewish people would sell their food to the Gentile neighbors. Now, something started to happen that wasn't too nice. I'll just put it that way. They might have sold it, let's say, for $20. When they went to buy it back at the end of Passat, the owner of it said, oh, no, 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 it's $35 now. So our Jewish people were getting gouged every which way, and the rabbis had to come up with a solution. So they did. They always come up with a way. <laughs> they said, okay, get a, a um, what do I call it, cabinet, cabinet. Yeah. like a cabinet, get something that can lock. Put all of your things in there, Lock it. Sell your key to your neighbor. Then if the neighbor wants to gouge you when the sock is over, break into your cabinet, you've got your things. <laughs> <laughs> but they tried to find a way to keep it, and as stringent as it seemed, it had an ancient benefit, because as you go down through history, the plagues and so forth that hit other people did not hit the Jewish people because of that level of cleanliness that they had to attain to. Now, once everything's done and it's just about to send down the first night of Passover, Ima, Mama has left a little bit of hummus somewhere in the house, a little bit of dirt. The kids and the dad, Abba, they go looking for it. And when they find it, the father takes a piece of paper, a feather duster, he scoops it up in that, carries it outside, they burn it, and he says a prayer that declares the whole house is leaven-free. It's now kosher and ready for Passover. And if the prayer even says, if anything's been missed, it now belongs to the earth. It doesn't belong to them, so they're, they're ready and they're set. And Ima's ready to breathe a sigh of relief, I'm sure. She gets one more job, and then her, her time is done. What she does is she lights the candles just ahead of the sun setting to start for Passover. Now she lights the candles on Shabbat, on Sabbath also. Usually those are two candles and they're usually separate. And we're taught that they're to recall and remember. And there is a slight difference in those words, so if you need help later I'll explain, but we'll move on forward. In my father's tradition for Passover time, they used a three-pronged candlestick. The only time it was used, it was one single, three-pronged, one base. Now, you ask our Jewish people, why three? And they'll tell you, hmm, maybe it's for Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or it might be for God, the patriarchs I just mentioned, and the people. Or maybe it's God and the priests and the people. We don't know. <laughs> but they know that it's a tradition and they're to do it. Now, those of us who are messianic, which means we believe in Yeshua Jesus as Messiah and Savior, begin to see a picture that is developing. You know, God uses everything. He gives us all kinds of object lessons. He gives us all kinds of pictures all the way through scripture. So it's not something strange to look for. Why the difference? What's the picture starting to show us? So as we see it, we notice something else about that. We notice it looks very similar to another one of our Hebrew olive bait letters, and that's the letter Shin or Shin. It looks a lot like our W, but it's tied at one base. But if you notice, all three branches are equal. Now what I find very interesting is that God, Elohim, chose this letter out of 22 letters to stand for himself. 
And you might be asking yourself, why would he choose this letter above all other letters? And I will tell you because I believe he is showing us a picture of what we call the triunity of our God. That he is Jehovah God the Father, he is Yeshua God the Son, and he is the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Three equal, three personifications, but we have one God. Then when you know our Hebrew prayer that is the most reverent for our Jewish people, said every morning, said every night, they want it to be the last thing on their lips before they die. And in fact, so many said it on, on the way to the gas chambers in the Holocaust that many of the Nazi soldiers could repeat the prayer in Hebrew by the time the Holocaust was over. That prayer says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It's from the book of Dovarim, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. It goes longer, but in that one phrase I've said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now the word echad at the end, that's the word for one that God used to stand for himself. But in Hebrew we have two words that stand for one. We have yachid and we have echad. Yachid means one that, like, I have one cup. That's all it is, it's just one cup. If I break it apart, I have one broken cup, but I still have one cup. But echad means one that can be divided. The closest I can get is to think of an egg. It's not perfect in the picture because an egg does have three parts, a white, a yolk, and the shell. But all three parts are not equal. That's why it breaks down. And there are other three sums that we look around in nature and see, but they all fall short because nothing is going to equal our God. Nothing is going to be able to come up to his level in our earthly world. But I see that God chose to use the name where he was teaching our people from the beginning. I am one that can be divided. I'm one that I can be divided. I'm not Yahid, I'm Echad. And now the Shin here in this, I see a picture of our triune God, the three in one. And when we know also that God the Son, Yeshua, declared in Yochanan, John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Well, we have the light. So I think that we're seeing very easily a picture of our God. <coughs> to show our Jewish people the fullness of who he really is. Uh, I thought of something and it went right through my mind. Oh, why does the mother light the candles? The not so nice answer from our rabbis is it was Eve who caused the light to go out of the world, so it's up to the mama to bring the light back in. <laughs> But I will say what I also learned, and I learned it from my father, and it's true, it was true in our household, even though my father had the orthodox background, the children learn at the feet of the mother. So as she lights the candles, it's symbolic of her lighting in their hearts, kindling it into their hearts, that they might grow up with it and embrace it also. And I guarantee you, I learned as much of my Jewishness from my mom, who had less of the background, as I did from my dad, who had all of the background. So she gets to light them. I will also remind you while I'm getting ready, she covers her head. And at Passover time, we always use white, white for purity. During the year with the other candles and other times, the, the, the keeper that I'll show you in a bit, it can be other colors. But I also will remind you that this is a festival of redemption. And it was kindled by the hand of a woman. And if you think, okay, what does she mean? Well, remember, the Redeemer came into the world as the seed of the woman. So there you go. <laughs> I redeem us. <laughs> and she lights the candles. As she does, she says a prayer in Hebrew. <coughs> the hardest part of the ceremony. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And she always, the same way the candles are lit at Shabbat, where she lights them, they do not blow out the candle, that's work, so they just get rid of it. And she makes a motion to bring it into her mind and then out of her heart, her mouth speaks. Baruch atah adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'alom, asher kiddushonim, b'mizvotah, b'tzibonu, ner shel yom tov. 
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your candles, I'm sorry, with your commandments, and has commanded us to light the Passover, or the, the holiday candles, as they say. And with that job, she is now done. She gets to sit down, and she gets to relax and enjoy the rest of the evening. Since I am Yahid and not Echad, <laughs> I'm going to it encourage you to use that child imagination tonight with me as I make a little change and I'm no longer the Ima, I will be the Abba. <laughs> so I'm going to show you what the father would look like. He will have a white, and Hebrew is called Kippa. If you're used to it being called Yarmulke, that's the Yiddish, but at, at Passover time again, <coughs> always white. During the year, it can be other colors. And no, the clips aren't necessary, but when you're a girl, <laughs> you have to do it to keep it on. So the kippah is white. It's always on their head so that they remember God is above them. And for the Orthodox man, he will wear a hat even to bed. So at bedtime, when he'll slip off the kippah, he wears all day as he's slipping on the nightcap because he never wants a moment when he's not respecting that God is above him. Then he puts on what is called a kittel, and it is a white robe. It always has to be white. And in fact, my sister was in Israel once at the time of uh, Pesach. No, actually, it was another one of our holy days. But it's when they dress in white completely. A lot of times you're used to seeing in your pictures the black robes. But the ones who, at this time, because of it, were all in white. And she snapshot in a picture without even knowing what she was getting. <laughs> and I just knocked my earpiece out. Sorry, folks. <laughs> okay, did I get it back in right? Okay, okay. So if it looks a bit to you like the priestly robe, that's perfect. Because that's what the father is supposed to be representing. He is the priest of the family. And he's going to be representing God to his family and his family to God. So always in white. And uh, this was my father's <coughs> of blessed memory. He's in heaven and I, I trust he's good with his daughter <laughs> taking his part for him. And uh, he's, he's ready in how he's dressed. They use, uh, well, let me tell you, too, that you heard you were coming to Passover Seder, S-E-D-E-R. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You do have little candles at your table. Where's Rowena? She was supposed to flag me if I forgot. My apologies. You can light your candles, women. <laughs> you can help the others. We'll even forgive if, if the men light their candles tonight, too. But we thought you'd want to participate, and I'm sorry I forgot to include you when I did it. But the word Seder, if you heard you were coming to Passover Seder, S-E-D-E-R, Seder means order. We have an order as we go through the Passover. And we use a book called a Haggadah. Now, you have some at your table. We're not going to go through it in order tonight. I'm going to bring out highlights. Or I would have you here till 6 tomorrow morning. <laughs> but uh, they can come in different shapes and different colors. I even have, I have vintage. I even have my dad's Passover <coughs> which has the same contents, even though it was much smaller. This is probably dating back about the 1920s, I would say. So if you want to see it better later, you can come up and look at it, but I don't pass it around because it's a little ancient. <laughs> um, they follow the Haggadah. A Haggadah is a Hebrew word that means telling, because they're telling the story. And they're going to tell the story again and again and again. So uh, they have their books, their Haggadahs. Uh, I've told you everything that they're wearing. Um, so, uh, oh, and by the way, Shmok, Exodus 13, 8 says, you shall tell your son, because the sons especially have the importance of stepping into that priestly role. So, but we'll say today, you shall tell your children. Again, the telling, the passing down. If you look that up in the Hebrew, it would have the word Haggadah there, uh, the telling. So with that, I think we're ready to have, let you participate just a little bit again. You have in front of you grape juice. You're going to sip from it four times this evening. So uh, make sure it lasts or let us know to get you some more grape juice. There are four prayers 
Did I forget to get out my, uh-oh, I think I forgot to get out all of my, sorry, I'm, uh, just give me a second, I have all of my scriptures written out. It's Shmot, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And I grabbed the wrong folder. Uh, in there are four promises. Here we go. Okay, that means they're in here somewhere. I am going to have to find them, but I can start without it. Sorry. Here they are, right? I put my whole stack together. My apologies. Okay. Exodus Shemot, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. I will only read as far as the first step, but we'll keep reading. I'll keep telling you when we're ready for verse number 7. I will let you know that also. But it starts with, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's our first part. So you're going to take your cup. I don't This is mine. <laughs> you're going to hear the same prayer. Baruch HaTad and Ayelohenu, Melch HaAlam, Berei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And with that, the Father will tell you this first cup is the cup of sanctification. I'm sorry, the first cup is the cup of deliverance because God just said, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from the Egyptians. So with that having been said, you may sip your first cup. And then remember that there will be three more times that we will sip from that cup. We'll keep reading in order in Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. That's uh, all in verse 6 right now. The fruit of the vine is a symbol of thanksgiving God has provided and is a joyful symbol also. So they remind everyone this is a time to be thankful, to be joyful. God has supplied for you. Now, if they're following strict tradition, they have a time of hand washing. We didn't bring that to you tonight because by the time we can do that through a room, you will be here until 6 in the morning. <laughs> But uh, it's called the Netlot Yadahim, and it's the lifting up of the hands. It's also known as the Urchatz, which means washing or cleansing. Now, this was added to our traditions that, that we're doing. We don't see it recorded in Shmoh and Exodus where they were told to do it. And tradition, they will tell you, well, this is part of our legend. This is to remind you of Miriam's well. And Miriam's well followed us through the desert. Miriam's well had living water. Miriam's well was a source of strength. It was renewal for all who drank from it, and it even helped our people understand the Torah, their first five books in the original covenant better. But I have to say, why Miriam? Where in our scriptures do we see Miriam associated with living water? Where do we see Miriam's well? We don't. So I question and I ask, and most of our rabbis will say, I don't know. <laughs> but what I think that they're missing is it is a perfect symbol of what did follow them through the wilderness. The water that came miraculously out of the rock. The water that fed, watered, satiated, two and a half plus million people. It wasn't a little rock and a little streamlet. This had been gushing water and they always had the water they needed for the cooking, for the cleaning, for the drinking. This was no small miracle and it did follow them. And we know that when we read in scripture, we read of the rock that followed them and we read of the living waters that came from the rock and we read of the one who said out of him flows rivers of living water. And again, I believe we're seeing a picture of Messiah in our symbolism here. But this is all about the priests, and that again fits our Messiah because he is the great high priest, the Kohen Gadol, the great high priest that has come. Because the priests in the temple, in their ceremonies, they had this time of hand washing. Now, this isn't mom telling you, your hands are dirty, you're about to eat, go wash with soap and water. This was just strictly with water, and again, remember, it's talking about the lifting up of the hands, as well as cleansing. 
the real, the, the better picture what is drawing is purity again. The pure white, we're seeing the purity. And when we see that and we realize and understand that, we look at our priests who before they would follow through with the ceremony had that time of washing of their hands. And then we read in Tehillim in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The priests were the ones who would stand in the holy place. And the, the rest of that verse in the psalm says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So again, I think it's a picture of our priests, our great high priest, and when he, it, it, purity has to be to symbolize him. So by this point you're thinking, when is she going to quit talking and when am I going to get to eat? <laughs> I'm going to give you your appetizer. <laughs> We're going to take a look at the Seder plate. You have a plate in front of you with symbolic foods. I have a fancy plate. I'll tell you the difference later, but right now you have the same thing on yours that I have up here. And as I mention the different foods, please feel free to sample them and try them and hopefully enjoy them. Biblically, the only thing that had to be on that Seder plate is the lamb. And by the way, we do have lamb tonight, so you get an authentic pre-70 AD Passover Seder. And I'll explain that difference later. But you're as authentic as can be according to biblical times. So it has the lamb, it has the bitter herbs, and I'll explain that, and it has the unleavened bread. That's all that scripture tells us that it had to have. The rest are things that have been added in. Most of these traditions were at least by the first hundred years AD, which would have included Yeshua, Jesus' time on earth. Many of them, they think, went all the way back to Babylonian captivity time, which put them into 500s plus BC. <coughs> so we don't know exactly how it exactly went, but our revered rabbis were passing them down and saying this was to be a part. And I'll tell you a little bit of differences as we go along. It, it becomes very interesting as we see it. But in its originality, with just the three items, the Seder plate still had all the elements that spoke about Messiah's life. We'll see the suffering, we'll see the sacrifice, and we'll see the redemption just out of those three. And as they're telling the story of the exodus out of Egypt, out of slavery, freedom coming into the promised land, when we see the bigger picture, we see the exodus or the freedom from the slave being a slave to the, bond, the bondage of sin and death, and we come into the freedom of an eternal life. There's uh, quite a, a picture that you can just see the similarity here, and when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So with that, I will, um, in fact, why don't you start with your lamb? That's the, the meat that you have in front of you. And of course, that's a reminder of the lamb that was sacrificed. What they do now, if they're not uh, being spoiled by somebody like we were tonight, <laughs> they will have a shank bone on their Seder plate, but they will not touch it. They'll just look at it and it will just be a reminder to them that we cannot have the lamb because we cannot make the sacrifice. But go ahead and eat the lamb because you're eating authentic. You're eating what Yeshua would have eaten when he was here on this earth. Then also on your Seder plate, you have lettuce and you have parsley. Now, if I was telling you this is what you got for dinner tonight, how many of you would be excited? <laughs> that's a pretty meager diet. And they say to the children, that's exactly right, because when we were slaves, our diet was very meager. But we want you to do one more thing with that before you eat it. You have a little cup or a short squatty cup with a, a little bit of blue on it. That's salt water. Dip your parsley and then dip your lettuce. If you don't want to eat both, then dip one of them twice because you're to dip two different times this evening. And as you dip in that and then eat it, you're going to go, oh, that's salty. And your, the father will say, good. Now that will remind you of the salty tears that we cried when we were slaves. 
And it will also, when you dip it the second time, remind you of the salty Red Sea that God parted to bring us freedom from the Egyptians because he drowned the whole Egyptian army in that salty Red Sea. Anyone here been to the Red Sea? There's a few of us who have. It is salty, is it not? Saltier than our Pacific Ocean. It is salty. You also, and by the way, that's called carpus. If I give you the Hebrew word, that's called carpus. You also have an egg. Now, sometime I should paint my egg brown <laughs> because it's supposed to be a roasted egg, and it's reminding them of the burning of the temple. And that obviously, that was 70 AD, so obviously that's one of the things that's been added in. And if you ask them why the egg, they will say because it's a symbol of life. You have the complete cycle of life that you can see from an egg. New life can come from the egg. But it's also told to us that the longer it's cooked, the harder it gets. And that's our Jewish people. The more persecution, the more in the fire we are, the harder God makes us to withstand persecution. And that's why we're here today. <laughs> so they'll give you uh, several different reasons for it. You also have something that looks strange. It's a mushy, it's brown in color, and the Hebrew word for this is chorosis, but don't let that scare you off. I'll tell you, it's supposed to look like the mortar that they used for making the bricks, and then God, uh, I'm sorry, then the Egyptians took the mortar away, and they still had to make as many bricks. But God has freed them from that time of slavery, and freedom is sweet. So when you try the chorosis, you're going to find out it's sweet. It's made out of apples and cinnamon, a little grape juice, and whatever other spices that the one who made it chose to put in, sometimes nuts. But it should be a sweet taste to remind you of the sweetness of freedom. Now, you might want to save a tiny bit of it, don't eat it all yet, just in case you want to do what I'm going to tell you. Because you also have a radish. And a radish is going to taste bitter, especially after the sweet. <laughs> and again, they're to eat bitter herbs. So they're, they're going to eat the bitter herb. They're going to eat the sweet chorosis and the other things. But if you want to wait, you can eat your radish, you can eat the chorosis, or you can wait just a moment more, and I'll draw your attention to one more thing. On your table, you have a community plate of matzah. I have an entire sheet. Now, because I have a fancy tray, I have three layers underneath. I opened the curtain just a little, so I think you can see that there are three layers. If the father has this, he holds it up and he lets everyone see it. But if they have just the plate that sits on the table, then they have what's called a matzah tosh. That's a Yiddish word meaning matzah pocket. I have my father's, and in this, you will see as I pull down that there are three separate compartments with the cloth. Now, if I was using this tonight, I would have put three whole matzah sheets in there before I started, but because I have this one, I, I'm only, I only put it in here. Now, the father is going to pull out one piece of matzah. He always pulls out the middle piece, always. The other two pieces, you're never going to see. They're going to stay where they are through the whole ceremony. Now, if you're ahead of me and you remember what three is standing for, you're already beginning to get a picture. And keep in mind, it's always the middle piece that comes into view. And out of our three, what part of God comes into view? When he slipped into time and into space, he put on a face. And we call him Yeshua Jesus. We know Jehovah God is there. We know the Ruach HaKodesh is there, but we never see them, but we do see Yeshua Jesus. Now keep that in mind as we go through it because the Father holds this up and he says, let all who are hungry come and eat. And as he holds it up, he's very likely to pass it in front of those candles. And if you're on this side of the room or if the camera catches it, you can see light through 
I think we're off the camera. It may not be showing there, but uh, you might be able to hold your little candle and your piece of matzah and be able to see light through it. The Father is pointing out to the people that there are characteristics to this matzah. Notice that it is striped. Notice that it looks kind of bruised. Notice that it is pierced. That's why you can see the light through it. Now, he's just pointing out these characteristics, but immediately in our mind, those of us who, who believe in the fullness of it, we see what comes to mind is Yeshaya or Yeshahu, Isaiah, our prophet, who in chapter 53 and verse 5 says, but he was bruised for our iniquities, crushed because of our sins. The uh, chastening for him fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Verse 7 tells us he was oppressed and he was afflicted. This is called the bread of affliction. I'll explain that in a bit too. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. And then we think of our prophet Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 12 and verse 10. We see in this, again, our triune God, because God is speaking and he says, I will pour out on the house of David, the house of David, and those living in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. There's God the Father speaking, there's our Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. But then God goes on speaking and he says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And I'll ask you, when was God I think I heard the answer out there. <laughs> we know in Yeshua, the son, when he was on the cross, he was pierced. So we see him bruised. We see the stripes that were healed by. We see the piercing. We see the body that is broken. So I go on with that verse. It says, the mourn for him is when mourns for an only son. And he is the only begotten son of God. They'll mourn in bitterness, like the bitterness for a firstborn. We'll revisit that verse a little later. But here's what gets very interesting as we go through this ceremony. This part of our whole Seder has a name for it, and that name is Afikoman. Now, if you've got a Jewish background, and I think maybe a pastor has some Hebrew? No? You said something earlier that made me think you did. Okay. Well, let me tell you. When I go through my Hebrew, I don't find the word afikomen. But you know where I find it? It's Greek. Yeah. Now, you got to ask me, what's a Greek word doing in the middle of a Jewish ceremony? I'm so glad you asked. And I'll tell you, I'll give you the answer straight from the rabbis. <laughs> but I think God had a hand in this. Because that Greek word means he that comes or the coming one. Keep that in mind because the, even though we don't know exactly when this started, we do know that it was in our Talmud from the hundreds forward, from right around Yeshua's time forward. And it's very interesting that our Talmud, our commentary on our scripture says, after the lamb could not be at our Passover, the matzah was to stand for the lamb. Very interesting. It was to symbolize the Passover lamb. You've heard all that I've said. You remember that Yeshua himself said, I am the bread of life. And he said he was the bread that comes down out of heaven. All this recorded in Yohanan chapter 6, John chapter 6. But John chapter 1 comes before that. And when Yeshua was first starting into his ministry, Yohanan the Mercer, John the Baptist, saw him when he was baptizing. And he saw him coming. And he said something so poignant that we remember it thousands of years later. He pointed and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, he didn't say that because Yeshua was coming all wooly and on fours and going, ah, but he was pointing to something very interesting. 
And as we continue to follow this ceremony, the father now takes that piece of matzah and he breaks it. He takes half and he puts it in a white wooden napkin. It's hidden away and he actually hides it away. It will play a part later in the ceremony, but right now it's out of sight. I hope the wheels are turning. He takes the other piece and he's going to break a piece off and he's going to share it with everyone else at the table and pass it around and everyone is to eat it. I gotta hide it, not knock it on the floor. He'll take that and if you'd like and you didn't eat everything yet, you can put your radish on there, you can put your harosis on there. So you have a little bitter, you have a little sweet, you have a little sauce, you have a little meat, <laughs> meat quotes. Put another piece of your matzah on top, and you have what we call the Hillel sandwich. Hillel was a revered rabbi from Yeshua Jesus' time, or as my dad would always tell us kids, yes, yeah, see, McDonald's didn't make the first sandwich. <laughs> so if you'd like, eat a Hillel sandwich. If you ate your others already, then eat the matzah alone. I love matzah. Plain. I love matzo with anything on it. <laughs> but enjoy the matzo. Hopefully you've enjoyed your Seder foods. And we're ready now for that second cup. So you're going to pick up your cup. The same prayer said, Baruch Atah Elohim, Melech Alam, Berei Kri Agave. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. As you drink it, though, the Father will give the next meaning. He will say, this is the second cup. This, again, comes from Exodus 6, still in verse 6. And this part says, I will deliver you from their bondage. I'm going to separate you from the Egyptians. So it's called the cup of sanctification because sanctifying is separating. We know it when we're sanctified to God, we're being separated unto God. So drink your second cup, the cup of sanctification. And remember, you'll need juice two more times. But with that having been drunk and with uh, all that you've eaten off the Seder plate, hopefully we've awakened a big appetite because you get to eat. <laughs> so I don't know if you have a way you'd like to do it. I, I, I'm a, I don't want to have free fall where everybody, but let's say this, anyone who has dietary needs and needs to be getting food, why don't you make your way to the top of the line right now? Girls, is there any preparation needs to be done or are we ready to go? We might give them just a minute, but uh, you know, don't take too long. Once we get you through the line, you're going to get to eat while I go on. So uh, if you need to do something, go ahead. Otherwise, I think we are ready. And uh, why don't we just make it easy. First tables on this side of the room, go ahead and start the line. And sorry for you who are further away. Start in this end. That's what I should have asked before. What are the directions? Start near the open door and work your way down. And if you need help, let us know. We'll have you. Enjoy.
because of the, sorry, I should have let her all up around. Because I don't want to keep you here even till midnight. It might be 11.55, but what a year on that side. So I want to get it started because we have some more to, to enjoy and some more explanation. And as I was talking with one, I realized I left something really important out. When I talked about the lamb, I talked about the authenticity. I mentioned that the temple was burned down in 70 AD. The only place that the lamb can be sacrificed is at the temple. So from 70 AD forward, they cannot have the sacrificed lamb because it's not permitted to be sacrificed anywhere than right there at the temple in Jerusalem. So the question I want to ask you, if God demanded the lamb, has he condemned all of our Jewish people since 70 AD? And while you're thinking of that answer, I'm going to go through the rest of our ceremony and see if it doesn't help you with the answer to that question. That our Jewish people are left today with that, if they don't know the right answer, they are left, left with that. They might try to substitute uh, fasting, saying prayers, doing things to show God how serious they are, but we will ask them, where in scripture does it say that you can substitute? And there is nowhere. God requires the blood of the, of the lamb. So with that in mind, we'll come back into uh, our, our time together. And this is very typical. They have dinner in the middle of their ceremony, so you're doing it just as authentic as we can do it. And as I mentioned, they always try to include the children. So there are four questions that are asked. And the youngest child is the one who gets to ask. And in the Jewish home, from the time they are very little, they're coached with that Hebrew. So you'll see little three, four, five-year-olds that are ready to ask the four questions in Hebrew every time, every year. And of course, they become proficient in it. The four questions are in, and I put my Haggadah, here we go. The four questions are in your books. If you have a book near you, uh, this one is on page, okay, where did I, there we go, page nine. So look around page nine because they're all a little bit different. But if you want, that is where the four questions are. For the sake of time, and because I'm not the Lilo's and the youngest among us, <laughs> I'll just do it in English tonight. The little uh, child, usually a boy, asked his father, wherefore is this night distinguished from all other nights? Any other night we may eat either leavened or unleavened bread, but on this night only unleavened bread. All other nights we may eat any species of herbs, but this night only bitter herbs. All other nights, we do not dip even once, but on this night, we dip twice. And then the final question, all other nights, we eat and drink either sitting or reclining, but on this night, all of us recline. As the father answers each question, he tells the story again. Obviously, in short form, they're eating only unleavened bread because Passover and then the ceremony that follows is only unleavened bread. It does remind them of the, the bread that they, they left Egypt so quickly, the bread didn't have time to rise. But the unleavened bread, the seven days that follows, again, in scripture, leaven is always a picture of sin. So it's removing sin from the, from the ceremony and from the house. When they eat only the bitter herbs, remember the scripture said they were to eat the, the roasted lamb, the bitter herbs, and the matzo. So they're keeping... Uh, along with what God said, and the bitterness reminds them of the bitterness of life as slaves. And then why do they get twice? Remember I told you the tears of slaves and the Red Sea that was part of that salty. So again, the father's telling the story again and again and in different ways and, and bringing the children in. Why do they eat reclining? Remember I made the joke earlier about the pillow, but they will eat in a reclining position, especially at home, because that's what freedom allows you to do. As slaves, they would not have been able to. So they tell again, and they tell again, and the more, just like all of us, how do we learn? Repetition. Repetition. Do it again and again and again. 
They also have a special setting. I put a gold plate and a goblet right here, and if we were authentic, every table would have at least one empty chair. In your home, if you had 10 people coming, you set the table, set the table for 11. And the reason being is they know that uh, uh, Elijah, Eliyahu in our Hebrew, is supposed to come before Messiah comes. And they're hoping, because he's supposed to come in a time of trouble, and he's to help bring in that tranquility and peace, the messianic era that they are looking so forward to. And Israel today has much sores, as we say, much trouble. They're hoping for Messiah to come and to settle the trouble that they're having. So this would be a great time for Elijah to come, or Yahu to come. And if there's any chance he would be passing by, they want to be able to invite him right in to be the honored guest at their Passover. And they don't want to have to hustle and, and ask, you know, uh, Sadie, would you move over? Jacob, scoot down a little. They want it ready so that Elijah would feel honored and expected. And so they always have a place ready for him. As you can see, I have a chair here but no one would sit in it the entire evening unless we were the ones of the fortunate to have Elijah come by. So the same little one who's asked the questions would go to the door at this time. The, the, the father would tell him, go to the door, open it, look out and see if there's any chance that Elijah's passing by and we could invite him in. And since I see one of my gals right at the door, <laughs> Amanda. Amanda. Amanda, can you look out the door and see if Elijah's out there? <laughs> Do you see him? <laughs> I think that was a no. <laughs> so the disappointment that he's not there. But there's a little poem I'd like to read to you. And it says, it, uh, let's see. let me tell you this first and then I'll read the little poem. We know those of us who have looked at the Brich Hadashah, the new covenant that follows our original covenant, which, by the way, is one complete story. It is all his story. It's all his story. It goes from Bereshit Genesis to the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, the first three words of the last book. It's all continuous. It's not one side Jewish and one side Christian. It is all Judeo-Christianity. Right may be concealed in the original will be revealed in the Brit of the New Covenant. But we see the completion. And when we see this time, we see that in the, the book called Matthew, and in Hebrew is Matthew, he was a good Jewish boy. He was writing to a Jewish audience. And he told much of what happened in Yeshua's life. And it recorded in Matthew, in chapter 17, verses 11 through 13, Yeshua was talking to his Talmudim, that's his disciples who were following him. And he spoke to them, and in fact, I think I have it, I do. He said, on the one hand, Eliyahu is coming, Elijah is coming, and, all will, and will restore all things. On the other hand, Yeshua is speaking, I will tell you that Eliyahu has come already. And the people did not recognize him, but did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man, too, is about to suffer at their hands. Then the Talmudim, his disciples, understood he was talking to them about Yochanan the Mercer, John the Baptist. What Yeshua was saying was, if they would have accepted him as Messiah, then Yochanan, John, would have fulfilled the promise of Eliyahu coming and preparing the way. Because Yochanan was preparing the way for the Messiah, as we saw, even when he called out, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So they began to understand this, and sadly, our Jewish people as a whole to this day still do not realize and look for Eliyahu to come. So they open the door, and we're even told that uh, because the ceremony is different in every home that they're following the story, that if you're in a Jewish community, that you, some have said they've been on the outside and about the same time they'll watch the door open almost simultaneously down the street because they're all looking for Eliyahu. And my dad used to tell the story also that uh, there was a family invited to a Seder at a home in Israel. They got into a taxi, 
and they couldn't find the home. They were looking and looking. It's getting later and later. They knew they'd already missed the beginning because the sun had set. Finally, the taxi cab driver says, I'm just going to go to this door and ask these people if they know where the Coens are. So he's approaching the door right when the little guy was going to open the door. <laughs> and you got it. <laughs> With big eyes. <gasps> Sir, are you Elijah? <laughs> and you can imagine his disappointment when he found out he was not. But uh, with that in mind, I'd like to read the uh, little poem that we have. Mine's a gold goblet, so forgive me because this one calls it a silver, but you know, we have a little freedom. It says, Elijah, where are you? His silver goblet is filled to the brim. His place at the table is ready. We've thrown open the door to welcome him, though his yearly absence is steady. But still we wait, and still we hope. And we wonder, and we hope a bit more, till the youngest among us asks with a smile. Could it be that he came to the back door? Could it be that he came in a way they didn't understand, and they didn't expect, and they didn't accept? There's a very beautiful song. It's called Eliyahu Hanabi, Elijah the Prophet. It's got the Jewish flavor to it. If any of you have a Jewish background, you'll know what I mean. You're welcome to sing the words. They are Hebrew words. It, it calls him son of David. It calls him a prophet. It, it's the one who is coming, the one who is telling. But I hope you'll just enjoy it if you don't want to try to sing the Hebrew words whichever way. Uh, I hope it'll be a blessing to you now. Works well in rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he can get it back because we have another song coming to this interactive for sure. <laughs> Well, I can play the song without the words. There you go. It'd be better if you can because we're going to come up with Dianu and have the problem. See if I can keep up with it. I'll tell you what, while he's trying, we'll just end up with a couple of songs back to back. I can do one, one thing in between that might help to fill in a little time. If you get it, Roger, let me know. They will also remember the ten plagues. Remember the telling again and again and again. So in just a few moments, if you've got one of the books in front of you, and I'm sorry that I didn't have enough for everybody, and I do request you leave the books behind because we can't get them anymore. That's why we have less and less. But uh, um, it's in some of the books, it's on page 18 or 19, somewhere right around there. You'll probably see where the 10 are listed. I have one of my books marked, and I'm looking for what I did with it. Okay, so what, here we go. I think this is the one I have it marked. And yes, okay. You're going to find a list that looks something like this, probably somewhere around those pages. And what the father does is he takes some of the grape juice or the wine, and I can fill in time for you, Roger, if I still need, I can tell another story. <laughs> but he takes it. And he will spill a drop as every one of the, the plagues is mentioned by name. If they do it the way they did with my dad, it was on a white linen napkin and spilling the juice, you saw this thing get bigger and bigger and got the idea how it got worse and worse. And it finally culminates in the death where, where the, they, it just, the state never comes out, so to speak. So we can practice that if you'd like, like the, the fathers do. And then I'm Roger gave me the signal, we'll go back and do Eliyahu. But if you have a list, you can say with me, blood, blood, blood. firm, firm. 
Burning. Actually, I see this one went across the page. Sorry. We'll start again. We'll go blood, blood. frogs, frogs, vermin, vermin, wild beasts, wild beasts, pestilence, pestilence, boils, boils, hail, hail, locusts, locusts, darkness, darkness, slaying of the firstborn, slaying of the firstborn. And you can see the heaviness as a continued each time it's getting worse and worse as i said the bigger the stain that's coming out um, are we ready okay we'll give it a try again <laughs>
almost guarantee you. <laughs> they also, during the course of the evening, will read Psalm 113 through 118. They read them in entirety, again, because I really won't keep you here till 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of verses from Tehillim from Psalm 118. If I started with verse 24, you would say, oh, I know that verse, because that's, that's a very popular. You may have even said it to the Lord this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't take anything away from you saying that every day to the Lord. That's great. If that's what you do, <coughs> you have that. But if you want to know what day in particular was being referred to, we need to back up in context. And I'm going to start reading for you from verse 22. The very rock that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This has come from Adonai, and it's in our eyes amazing. This is the day Adonai has made, a day for us to rejoice and be glad. Please, Adonai, save us. Please, Adonai, rescue us. That's verses 22 through 25. And even though I've told you there's your context, if you're not Jewish, you probably are saying, okay, I still don't get it. What are we talking about? What's this rock? What's this cornerstone? What are they referring to? But our Jewish history is very clear on this. And what we are told is that when the first temple was being built, and if you're not familiar, the temple's up on the, the platform or the plateau of the mountain. The building of the temple had to be all done quietly. The work wasn't done on site because that would have been disrespectful to the Lord that they're making the temple for. So the stone quarry was down below and the stones would be carved out or hewn out, and then they would be sent up that mount to the temple mount where the builders would be laying the stones as they were being sent up. Now, this is no small feat because those stones were huge and they were heavy, probably averaging about five tons for each stone. If you've heard of the group Temple Mount Faithful that today has tried to lay the cornerstone for the third temple, that stone is six and a half tons that they are taking and having to send back and take and have to send back because Israel isn't ready for it. it there's too much controversy. It breaks <coughs> out in almost a war. And so the authorities say, no, don't. It's, it's not time. But back into our Bible times, the first temple, and we're told even the second temple, used the same cornerstone. Whether that part is true, I don't know. But what I do know is this story is true that as they were building, the cornerstone usually is laid either first or very quickly near the beginning because it is the predominant stone in that foundation that's going to be the, the, the uh, pivotal point for all the rest of the building of the temple in this case. So it would be put where the two walls would meet, all the angles that would go off from it, if it wasn't set right, that wouldn't be right. And when they build on it, the, all the other stones and essence are going to rest on it. It's going to be that foundation. So it had to be very large. It had to be very solid. It had to be very specific. It had to fit exactly right. And then everything, as I said, go out from it. So some of those stones in that, uh, uh, the whole foundation layer had been set. And one day a stone came up that was very misshapen. And it, it was so odd that uh, to put it in today's vernacular, our people joke today and say, well, they were stoned in the quarry last night. And so they put out something that wasn't quite right and they rejected that stone. They tossed it down into the Kidron Valley because remember it's on the, like a mountain plateau. So they tossed it down in the Kidron Valley and they went on and crazy and they had to have that foundational stone. They had to have the cornerstone. So they sent down word to the quarry, send up the cornerstone. And the word came up that, well, we sent that up some time back. It's, it's already there. And they thought, it's not here. We don't have it. When one of the workers remembered, hey, remember that odd shape that we thought was done wrong and we rejected it? What if that's it? So they went down into the Kidron Valley, they brought it back up, and of course it was exactly the right cornerstone. 
They put it where it belonged, brought everything else around and fit, and it, everything fit perfectly. Wow. Knowing that story, then when you read, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You know what's being talked about. It makes it come to life, and as they begin to see and understand that, it doesn't end there. Because in that good Jewish book that I told you about by the name of Matthew, Mattathiah, mm -hmm. chapter 21 and verse 42, Yeshua Jesus took the opportunity to point to that cornerstone in, in symbolically. But what he said was he was referring to himself, that he was the rejected cornerstone. And he told that to his Talmud. And as I said, you can read it in chapter 21 and verse 42. <coughs> that, um, I'll roll it out for you. I did. Yeshua said to them, haven't you ever read in the Torah? No, I'm sorry, in the Tanakh. Tanakh is all of the original covenant. Torah is the first five books. But haven't you read in the Tanakh? The very rock which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This has come from Adonai, and it's in our eyes. Amazing. You heard me read that from Tehillim from Psalm just a few minutes ago. Yeshua said to them, did you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected. This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. He was drawing their attention to the fact he was being rejected, that he is that chief cornerstone. One of his Talmudian, one of his followers by the name of Kepha in Hebrew, Peter in English, became, came to the point where he knew and understood this. And after Yeshua had resurrected, had gone back into heaven, he was talking very quickly after that time to a group of Israel, of the people of Israel. It's recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. And in the middle of his, and I'll call it a bright sermon, is our Jewish history, and he's just nailing it, and I'll use that word on purpose. He said, Then let it be known to you and all the people of Israel that it is in the name of the Messiah, Yeshua from Nazareth, so he specified exactly who he was talking about, whom you executed on the stake as a criminal, but whom God raised from the dead. This man that Kiva had just healed, this man stands before you perfectly healed. What he was saying, and as I go on, I'll just let the scripture speak for, us, for itself. This Yeshua is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. That's verse 11. And then he brings it all the way home. Verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. No other name under heaven where one might be saved. That's Acts 4, verses 10 to 12. Keep the drawing on that rejected cornerstone, letting them know. He didn't let them guess. He didn't let them wonder. He said, is Yeshua the Messiah, the one from Nazareth? He again records in his books that are written toward the end of Arbor and Chadashah in 1 Peter, 1 Kepha. He, read, he wrote, or he spoke, <coughs> chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. This is why the Tanakh says, Look, I'm laying in Zion, in Zion, a name for Jerusalem. I'm laying in Zion a stone, a chosen and a precious cornerstone. Whoever rests his trust on it, will certainly not be, and your version may be humiliated or put to shame or confused. That whatever it all is, that same meaning. Verse 7, now to you who keep trusting, he is precious. But to those who are not trusting, the very stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It wasn't dependent on their believing that it be so. But he's letting them know you are missing it if you are still rejecting that cornerstone. When Kepha recorded that in 1 Peter, he was drawing back also on our prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Because he said in Isaiah, therefore here is what Adonai Elohim says. Look, I'm laying in sound a test of stone, a costly cornerstone, a firm foundation stone. He who trusts will not rush here and there, will not run to and fro in confusion. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. 
he who believes will not be disturbed. Kepha and Yeshaya, it sounds exactly the same, because it was. He was quoting Isaiah and letting them know, here is what our prophet Isaiah spoke about. When we see this from Tehillim Psalm, we see it from Isaiah, we see it from Kepha, we see it all the way through. We know that this is nothing short of the fulfillment of what was said to us in the beginning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I know I'm speaking to believers today in this room who are very soon going to be celebrating a very special day on our calendar. It's our Resurrection Sunday. It's, it's third day. And when you hear this and see it, let that resonate with you. What is rejected? That those who have found, put their faith, are not confused, are not in in all the, the words I gave you earlier that I can't suddenly think that they have the sure foundation of their faith. It's not only there in our cornerstone that's been shared with them that, uh, that we see and that we understand, but also what I want to make sure that you realize is that last supper that Yeshua ate, Jesus before his crucifixion, was the Seder dinner. It was the meal that you just had, and I don't mean our potluck part, but the symbolic foods is what was happening when Yeshua met with his Talmudim, and he took what was their usual, what they'd been doing for thousands of years, but he didn't want them to miss either. And with this background in view, hear the words as he said, and I, I'm taking again from our good Jewish boy, Matthew, chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. While they were eating, Yeshua took a piece of matzah, made the blessing, broke it, gave it to his Talmudim, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now remember when I took that piece of matzah, and he broke it, and he all were to take and eat. And that's when Yeshua said and did what he just did. Also, he took a cup of wine, made the barucha, and which means a blessing, and he gave it to them, saying, now remember how you've already drunk twice from your cup. It's the same thing. He's taking that cup and he's saying, all of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which ratifies the new covenant. My blood shed on behalf of many, so that they may have their sins forgiven. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine again until the day I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. If we stopped right there, just with Matthew, I would have to say to you, it was one of the four times that they sipped from the cup. I couldn't be more specific than that, but I love our scriptures. And our scriptures give us every detail that dots every I and crosses every T. I'm going to take you to Luke. Luke adds one little detail. If I start out with Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it sounds the same. Also taking a piece of matzah, he made the broke it, broke it, gave it to them, said, this is my body which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But verse 20 is the key. He did the same with the cup after the meal. That tells me it's the third cup. It's the cup that's followed the meal. This cup is a new covenant ratified by my blood, which is being poured out for you. Why do I stress that? Let me take you to the third cup. You can pick up your juice and be ready to drink the third cup. And the Father will read this part. He will tell them, you are now sipping, and don't miss it, from the cup of redemption. And the bit of scripture that he reads says, I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And as they sip and as you sip and drink that third cup of redemption, and you hear Yeshua saying these words to his Talmudim, it was literally just hours later that he stretched out his arms and died for the redemption of our souls. Amazing how thousands of years earlier, in a ceremony that was set in place, God was pointing the picture because it's all about the cross, looking to it or looking back at it. And here we see in the living color 
How can they miss when it's the third cup of redemption, his blood being shed? Leviticus, Viagra, chapter 17 and verse 11 tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and God speaking says, I have given it to you on the altar for the remission of sins. And if you ask, well, when did God put blood on the altar? I will tell you he did it in the person of the Son when he shed his blood and it was placed on the mercy seat in heaven for forgiveness of sin for all mankind. There's a curtain that separates the holy place from the holiest place. When Yeshua died on the cross, it was split into from top to bottom, thicker than a man's hand, miraculously split, especially showing from top to bottom. It wasn't something man was doing. And I love to say that Yeshua, when he broke his body, he, would, he broke open through that curtain. It was pinned back with nails, and the way into heaven was made because he put his blood on the altar, so he paved the way to heaven through the shed blood that we're seeing pictured here. <coughs> this is why Yohanan said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it was no accident that Yeshua's sacrifice of his body was at the very time the lambs were being sacrificed at the temple. The blood of the lamb to bring salvation for our people from Egypt originally, but the blood of Messiah to bring freedom from sin for all mankind. We have a beautiful song that we'd like you to, to share in singing called Passover Lamb, and Roger will play it for us now.
59, 11 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And we know again that his outstretched arms are what bring us that salvation. 1 Corinthians, written by another good Jewish boy by the name of Shaul, you know, Miss Paul, chapter 5 and verse 7 said, Purge out therefore the old leaven, drew right on the picture of what we were doing, that you may be a new lamp as you are unleavened, for even Mashiach, even Messiah, you'll have Christ, but it's Messiah in Hebrew, our Passover is sacrificed for us. First we see a lamb for a man, that was when Abraham was going to offer up Yitzhak, Isaac, and God provided the lamb. Then we see a lamb for the household at our time now here when they're, they're fleeing from Egypt. We see that lamb not only for the family, it was for the nation. But as God said, for God so loved the world, we see that it's a lamb for the world. It's the lamb of God. And we say, blessed are you, O God, for you have in mercy supplied all our needs. You've given us Messiah, <coughs> forgiven our sins. You've given us life abundant and life everlasting. It's all about the lamb. We are almost finished. We're going to have our fourth cup, which is the cup called praise. We're now into verse 7 of Exodus, verses six, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And this part we read, Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And when we know that we are God's, he is our God, and we are His people. We have that praise that we can give Him the, the cup of praise. So you can sip your fourth cup, the cup of praise, and you can praise Him. Our Jewish people say that they are looking forward to that restoration, and they will praise Him. And we know that He said when He comes in His kingdom, which tells us it will be fully restored, he will drink that cup of praise with his people who will be saying he is their God and they will be his people. And I say, hallelujah, it's what's coming. <laughs> now the very last thing that we have is that of the common. Remember, is he that comes after or the coming one? Some even call it the dessert. They say it's the best is yet to come and all of this is right. Because we're not finished with that awful moment. It's been a great picture, but it's not over yet. At this time, the Father has hidden that awful moment, that piece that was wrapped in that white linen napkin. He's hidden it somewhere in the house. And the children, or those young at heart, get to go look for it. The one who finds it and brings it to the Father gets a prize. So, children, or children at heart, Go look, and when you find it, bring it to the Father.
We've seen all kinds of, of symbolisms and pictures that we're bringing into today, and I just, I had to laugh because this was given to me. Technically, Moses was the first man to download files from the cloud using his tablet. <laughs> so with that download, the father brings out now what had been hidden away, and he unwraps the linen napkin. And you find that hidden piece of matzah. If you're ahead of me, you're seeing the beautiful picture. If this is, as I've said, accurately a picture of Messiah, then the, the Son of God, the middle candle, as we've been seeing through it all, if it is he who is broken, pierced, striped, all that we saw, then this should also fit. And does it not? Because for three days, he lay in a white linen napkin buried away out of sight. But yet all who come to the Father, to Jehovah, who find the, the Atacom and find the Son, they find the gift of eternal life. And that's for all. The Father takes this piece now, and he says it is dessert now. It deserves always the best, don't you know that? The best was yet to come. He takes a, and breaks it and eats a piece of it and passes it to everyone. Everyone is to eat the matzah and then not eat anything else the rest of the night so that they keep the taste of the best in their mouths. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And he is for all. Everyone who comes to the Father through the Son gets the Avacom, yes. gets the price of eternal life. So if you want dessert and you don't have matzah around you, you can come get some and we'll, we'll make sure it's around. But you can eat a bite for the very end because we are right at the end now. But traditionally, our Jewish people always do one more thing, and that is they say, next year in Jerusalem, because they're hoping it'll be there with, with Yeshua, with the Messiah. And those who are in Israel will say, next year in the rebuilt temple, because that's their hope. So we're going to close with a fun song. It's a short song. It's La Shana Haba'ah Ba Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And that's when everyone will be saying, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So as you sing it, rejoice, he has come. He is coming again. Hallelujah. because they cannot make the sacrifice, and the answer is a resounding no. The Lamb of God is the sacrifice forever. With that blood in place on the heavenly mercy seat, there was no more need for the lambs. When the temple was done away, I think it was even to help show our Jewish people, let go of that and put your faith in the one who is the Lamb of God forever. Hallelujah. Pray our people will come with the Luda. If anyone here has not accepted the, the Messiah into their hearts, he's not just for the Jewish people. He's for the whole world, as we said. If you're Gentile, if you're Jewish, and if you're my dad's point word, part Jewish, part Gentile, if you're a Jew type, <laughs> it's good news for all of you. So, may the Lord bless you. May you have a wonderful time rejoicing this coming Sunday in the fullness of Messiah who him in once 
died, buried, resurrected, hallelujah, and he is at the right hand of the Father, one day coming again, and we will even see him set up his kingdom on earth. He keeps every word, and he is faithful. It's all about the cross, pointing to the cross first, looking back at the cross, it's all about the Lamb. So, take it with you, chew on it, taste and see, may it be the dessert, the best yet. Thank you so much for having us, it has been hard on Sam. What can I say? But shalom. Peace from the Lord. Shalom. Shalom. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank mm -hmm. you.